Hey everybody, welcome back to the Triple Play uh, podcast. This is the last show of the semester slash school year, so kind of sad that we're ending it, but we have a very full show today. I am joined today by Morgan, Jake, and David, and we are going to do a year in review because what a year it has been for Tennessee athletics. Nothing has happened. Absolutely nothing. We're just going to sit in silence for the next 30 minutes or so. Remember um, Peyton. See, I told you Peyton would make some kind of appearance in this. I said that in the preview. There you go, there you go, Morgan. You brought it up. Didn't it's even good. see that. That right wasn't even scripted. Good job. Right off the bat. So Peyton is officially here. Um, oh. So we can go ahead and start talking about Tennessee football. Nice little segue into that. Thank you, Morgan. Um, so the football balls, they've wrapped up spring practice, as we talked about last week with the Orange and White game. And now they're looking ahead to the 2016 season. But first, let's look back at 2015, Oof. what a season it was. The Vols finished 9-4, and four, second in the SEC East at 5-3. and three. Uh, The beginning of the season was definitely a bit rocky. Uh, it was just kind of going back and forth, win-loss, win-loss. Um, but the Vols finished strong with six straight wins. So looking back, which win out of the nine that the Vols had was the best of the best? Uh, I think the best of the best will probably have to be the Georgia one. Mm-hmm. Um, because think about it. They're down in that game huge, and they kind of flipped the script because the, the story of the season was blowing the leads, and now they're down. What was the score? Was it like 21-3? to three? It was 24-3. 24-3. Yeah, to three. 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 And But they, they came back so quickly, too. Like It was no doubt. But, uh, yeah, that's the most impressive win to me. Uh, and then you can throw in the bowl game as well, but I, I like uh, Georgia. Well, I'm going to disagree with you, David. I am going to go with the bowl game. Um, Here we go. Purely, well, number one, Northwestern – according to rankings, and most measurements was better than Georgia. You can make a debate about difference in talent and all that, but I think the biggest thing was that the Vols showed something that I think we can look forward to this year. I think the Vols that played against Georgia weren't the Vols we're going to see this year. Mm -hmm. This is a team that in the fourth quarter, when they were dominating a team, they didn't take their foot off the gas pedal. And those blown leads from the beginning of the season, those are learned habits. Winning Mm -hmm. and winning convincingly is a learned skill and you even saw against games like western carolina where they give up in the third quarter because they don't want to beat them too bad why not do what Ole miss did to like fresno state and or florida for that matter what Ole miss did to florida i mean 30 to zero well you mean michigan did to florida yeah wait michigan blew out florida florida Uh, Florida blew blew out Ole miss yeah Mm -hmm. wow Wow, i'm completely backwards here to monday yeah no it's all right it's it's the last week of classes, uh, you have every right to be a little bit frazzled, Jake. Yeah. I think we all are. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, real quick, Jake, before we go. I, I mean, like, I, I agree with everything you said. I just think, like, Georgia was kind of like a turning point for this team. Because imagine they no lose doubt. that game. Lose that game in Alabama, then the season could kind of spiral from there. But yeah. I see where you're coming from. No, I think we both make valid points. I think they were co-biggest games of the year. Obviously, mm-hmm. we're going to pick different sides to argue, yeah. but you can't deny that. I picked North Texas. Gosh. Turning point. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Yeah, yours, Jake. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to go ahead and um, break the tie by saying uh, Northwestern. <laughs> My man, Jake. <laughs> I knew I loved you. <laughs> you know, I think that uh, the resiliency that the Vols showed against Georgia was immeasurable. But at the same time, like Morgan, like what you said, being able to just not take their foot off the gas pedal in the third quarter continuing all the way to the end of the game, finishing strong. I think that that bodes really well for this season and gave a lot of people a really good chance to see the more of the team that they're going to see going into 2016. Well, I'm going to bring the tie back. My pick was Georgia. Uh-oh. Um, Daniel, I thought you were supposed I, to be the smart one. Uh, hey, <laughs> I'm the one, I'm the voice of reason here. We're going to be tied on this because... You're also the host of the show. So exactly. I mean so yeah. kind of, you know, but I'm... Um, No, I went with Georgia, and David, I think you hit the nail on the head. That was the turning point for this team this season, despite losing to Alabama the next week, because everybody expected Tennessee to lose to Alabama. But I think what was the difference in that game, um, kind of shifting focus over to Alabama, was how close it was. Nobody expected Tennessee to be that close to this Alabama team. So I think the win against Georgia really turned the tide. hate to use that, but... Tide didn't really turn against oh. the Crimson Tide, but I mean, anyway, I'm definitely you know, voting to remove you as host. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> then again, it, it is your show, so I don't have a vote. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but, but I will still try. Good try. I'll get I'll, kicked off. I'll try with you, Morgan. But you know, I think it just, it really changed. I think it changed a lot of things for this team this season. But also, we saw how bold 
Um, Josh Dobbs was against Florida. That was big. He was top rusher, receiver, and um, passer, of course. Allegedly. Exactly. (laughs) But, you know, in the game against uh, Georgia, he was the leading passer and rusher. You know, so I think we were able to see that same resilience. I know that word's already been used. I'm going to use it again. From him, especially in that game. But I think Tennessee just looked so dominant in that win Mm -hmm. against Georgia. And I think that that was the biggest win, definitely. So out of the losses... Which was the worst of the losses? Florida, because that counted as two losses. That we uh, Tennessee does not lose to Arkansas the next week if they don't lose to Florida. And it was probably the most gut wrenching, considering that it's been so long, so many chances. And and yeah, so long. You mm-hmm. mentioned Arkansas. I'm actually gonna go with Arkansas because you know here's the thing. I mean, most heartbreaking, Florida and Oklahoma are probably up there. But yeah. the worst loss, the loss that kind of scratch made me scratch my head the most is Arkansas. I mean, they started out the game fourteen to nothing, and then for some whatever reason it was, like they just couldn't regain the momentum and lost that again. offensive line. Yeah, I might, we might add they have they're the size of your regular NBA front court. Right. Yeah, I mean that that's true, and it's just that was a game that because you look at Alabama, like okay, we were close to Alabama, but no one really thought that we could beat Alabama. Then Florida, it's on the road, a rivalry game. Oklahoma is a college football playoff team, but Arkansas was just the game that. We shouldn't have lost. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, in terms of just pure heartbreak, I mean, Florida and Oklahoma, they had the theatrics and all the moments that will stick out. Oklahoma was my birthday weekend. I'll just throw it out there. You go, Oof. Jake. Yeah, um, Oof. I'm going to... Um, so, I'm going to kind of make two points here. So, the Arkansas game of this year, when Tennessee lost to Arkansas, I kind of related it back to the Wyoming game of Philip Fulmer's last year in that... Oh, yeah. In oh, that it's ouch. a game that you just don't expect them to lose. It's but, not as bad. It wasn't Wyoming. But as it was disheartening Arkansas. as, you know, the other, as the past two heartbreaking losses had been to Alabama and to Florida, you just don't expect that kind of loss to happen. Even, yeah. I mean, you expect them to bounce back in some fashion. That's but true. But at the same time, I made that point, but I'm going to go ahead and say that I think the most heartbreaking loss of the season was Oklahoma. First loss of the, or first, it was the home opener, and they lost, which obviously, in dramatic fashion, Oklahoma is a great team this year. They made the college football playoff, did really well. But coming into that game, you think about it, Tennessee had Checker Nealon going, you know, had the stadium just packed full capacity, and I think a lot of people thought that Tennessee was really back at that game. Because mm-hmm. going into the game, you know, you could feel the energy around Knoxville. You could feel what you thought was about to happen. And with the plays that Oklahoma made near the end of the game to take that win, I think that it really set a precedent for the rest of the season. Like what, Morgan, what you said, that, you know, losing in close games is a learned habit. And so that really set a big precedent into mm-hmm what I think really turned out to be a downward spiral of those really close losses that Tennessee had. Yeah, I couldn't pick one worse loss. Um, I had a toss-up. I spent a good 15, 20 minutes looking at these two, and it was Florida and Oklahoma, because I've never left a game so disappointed like I did with Oklahoma. Arkansas Mm. was very close. I was almost in tears on that one just because I was so heartbroken. Florida, walking back to my apartment, I it felt like I was walking through a puddle of tears the entire time. You know, so I think both of those, and like you said, Jake, the theatrics of that, you know, two overtimes and you lose to the Sooners, who obviously were a great team, but I think the hype was way too much mm-hmm. around that game because it's going to be, it's the season opener. You need to have an open mind heading into a game like that, especially against a team like Oklahoma, and I think it kind of just went against the balls. I think as we all have come to know very quickly and over the course of our entire lives, really, ball fans have a tendency to keep a very closed mind regarding the oh, team yes. heading into a season. You know, it's beautiful. It's beautiful, though. It's passionate. It's it passionate. passionate, but it can prove to be a very heavy downfall. We yeah, can't yeah, act yeah. like right. we're above it's, that. Yeah, I agree with you, Jake, on that one. We can't yeah. act like we're above that. You know why? Because we're those people. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's true with the Tennessee fan yeah. base. And I just think, even just around East Tennessee in general, you expect Tennessee athletics, and especially football, to be superior. Absolutely. That's the only way to look at it. But, I mean, looking back at the season, going 9-4, and four, that was good. No, Respectable. 
After seven and six. Yeah. That's what you had to have projected. You know what I mean? Like I think that's what most of us projected. I right. just didn't think that any of us thought it would be in as heartbreaking a fashion. Yeah, it's, as the, it way, it's right. the way that it right. happened. Yeah. Not so much that It's it not happened. the end result. It's mm-hmm. how we got there. Yeah. It's, right. I think it ended up being kind of an underdog story to an extent because, you know, you lose all those close games, mm-hmm. then rise from the ashes, if you mm-hmm. will, to finish off with a six-game win streak. And yeah. Just putting an absolute stopping on Northwestern. It does have to be worth noting, though, how weak the schedule was past that Alabama yeah. game. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I think oh, yeah. we, we have to keep that in mind. That's true. But it, but the most encouraging part of all that was how they kept it on teams in the third and fourth quarter late yeah. in the season. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, looking back at the end, I mean, definitely the schedule was pretty weak at the end. I mean, you had Kentucky, which was an easy game up in Commonwealth. South Carolina, that was a closer one. Uh, North Texas on homecoming, that was a shutout. Uh, Missouri was also close, but I think a lot of people expected that because whenever you play in Missouri, it's not going to be easy. Great whenever you play team. Missouri, Absolutely. Period. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think the Kentucky game, though, is worth noting because that game was on Halloween. That game played in a phone booth. Obviously, Tennessee should blow out Kentucky. Right. But it was a sold-out crowd. It was passionate. It was a night game. Kirk Mm Herbstreet. I mean, it had... I mean, not Kirk Herbstreet. Brent Musburger. It had the makings of an upset. Yeah. And then the balls just went out. It looked like it it was going to be a close game early on, and then the balls just did what they were supposed to, and I was encouraged by that. Big Blue Nation. But that's whenever you have to go back to Kentucky's leading... uh, Russia getting injured as well early on. That was the turning point of that game, which we discussed in full, you know. But I mean, looking back, nine and four was a respectable way for Tennessee to go out on the 2015 season. But let's look ahead really quickly at 2016 and make quick predictions of how you see the balls doing. Final record predictions. Oh, that's so tough. Um, mm. I I say regular season ten and two. Mm-hmm. I say regular season eleven and one, setting up a rematch with the hated Crimson Tide in the title game. I'm gonna go ten and two. Yeah, with that ten and two, I'm gonna say SEC East champs. Like, yeah. yeah, that's gonna be interesting though. If Alabama's unfeed and Tennessee's got the one loss mm-hmm. to Bama, especially oh, yeah. if Tennessee wins that, do we get two SEC teams in the title game? I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's never Daniel, know. You you take control. Now. I also getting, said wow. ten and two. But I want to throw out also that the losses I have are Georgia and Alabama. Ooh, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say. I'm, I'm torn on the Georgia I'm saying, one. I'm, saying Florida I'm throwing Alabama. it down there. It's I looked at game. Florida too, but I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping. I mean, Georgia's at Georgia. I know. It's that's a hard not going to be easy. Said. Exactly. Right. It's, it's a, especially, it's, it was a spring game, but Eason mm-hmm. made big boy throws. That'd if he good. can live up to his talent. We'll mm-hmm. see how <clears throat> Kirby Smart handles running a team. Exactly. Because we all know that when you're a defensive coordinator for Nick Saban, you're not necessarily so much a defensive coordinator. But And we have seen the failures of past Saban mm-hmm. defensive assistants. But Kirby Smart has put together a very good staff, and it's all about what he learned from, I hate to say it, but the best coach in college football. If he's, learned, if he's taken his opportunity and seen how Saban runs a team, if he – emulates that and he's able to do it successfully he's already done it with the hiring of great staff that's not going to be an easy game but i think the vols are more complete from a roster perspective but going down playing between the hedges is never easy Mm -hmm. now i do have a uh, quick question so we're looking at georgia and alabama but do you guys have any predictions for a and m because I mean, the Aggies can make Trevor a lot Knight of noise, an considering that it's in College right. Station. That was the one happen. I was looking at. I have it on here. You're my witness, Morgan. The one that's crossed out was A&M. I replaced it with Georgia just looking at it. I'm terrified of the A&M game. They've got the handsome man at quarterback. <laughs> well, that, but I mean... I say it a little Aggies, bit lustfully. Forgive me, fan base. <laughs> the Aggies just... You can't count them out, and that's what worries me. That's yeah. so that deep. offense can put up points, right? How's and that, but how's think, that defense going to play? Yeah, that's just, what I was about yeah. to mention. They have the chief there, so maybe if he follows his last few years at Tennessee, they'll be great for the first three quarters, mm-hmm. and then the fourth quarter, the biggest play of the game, not so much. Right. But it's that offense is going to put up points. Mm-hmm. That offense puts the living fear of everything holy in me, because Kevin Sumlin is a brilliant offensive mind. And Trevor Knight is incredibly handsome. It might distract the defense. Well, Back to you know, just... Trevor Knight, okay. It's going to be interesting to see what the balls do in this next season. I, I said it last season. Whenever we were wrapping up the season, I'm going to say it again. I hope fans keep an open mind. Just, yeah, that's, keep, just keep an open mind. 
and I uh, don't expect too much. That's all I have to say. I, Butch has been in, has been at the helm for a while now, but just don't have high expectations. He's still a young coach. He's still learning how to win. We saw that last year, but I think he figured it out. So I think it's okay to have high expectations because I don't see the schedule sets up. I mean, they've got four really tough games in my opinion, but I think three of those four, the balls will be favorites. Yeah, and Mor so Morgan, I think you're right in that it's okay to have high expectations. But at this point, I mean, with the running backs that Tennessee has and, and the defensive front that they're looking to set up. How about up, that quarterback, though? Very true. Um, I think that at this point that it's okay to have high expectations, but if you're Butch Jones, you want to keep those expectations from ballooning out of control. I think that also shows kind of a lack of faith in your team. That's all I'm going to say. I think he'd be smart. He'd be wise to embrace them. You know, we could make a full show yeah. to go on with what to look for for Tennessee in the upcoming season. We could probably and in the do that in the beginning last of the show. Fall. We probably will. We're going to. Yeah. It's um, there's no doubt about it. But let's go ahead and shift over to the Lady Vols because we still want to talk about basketball and then get into uh, play on the diamond. But with the Lady Vols, they had a season of ups and downs. That's the only way to look at it. Mm. Um, but yet they still found a way to make it to the Elite Eight. They finished 22 and 14, eight and eight in the SEC. But since they're still grinding for that ninth title, we're going to have a little play with that number nine and describe, I want you guys to describe their season in nine words. It ain't how you start, it's how you finish. Solid. It's a good one. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? I mean, yeah, uh, the regular season, uh, real quick, was tough, but I mean, making it to the late eight is always great. Mm -hmm. Nice rhyme there. But I mean, this is Tennessee, Final Four is expected. Um, not really sure about the trajectory of the team, honestly. I can't really say if it's going up or down or whatever. Yeah. Um, but UConn lost their three best players. Now women's basketball is wide open. I like mm -hmm. Syracuse next year, but Tennessee could be a Final Four contender again. I mean, they have been the whole Holly Warlick era pretty much. Right, and I, I've been looking at Syracuse too. I know we talked about that. Um, I want to say it was Emily and I that talked about it a few weeks ago on the show whenever we wrapped up basketball season. But my nine words that I have, um, I have this. Inconsistent, but years of promise could be up ahead. I think that's the only way to really look at this team. There were a lot of ups and downs. Like I said, inconsistency, inconsistency was definitely the story of the season. But I think I think things could be changing for this team, and it could definitely be for the better. My nine words are inconsistent, talent, 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 talent. There you go. I think this is a team that is super talented. I think uh, there was a fluky regular season. I think next year the Lady Balls will once again be a top 10 team. Mm -hmm. I think they have the talent to do so. And Holly is not as bad of a coach as people think. She's actually she actually did a great job down the stretch. Mm -hmm. She's went she's got more win. She's got a better record than Pat did through 4 years. I think it's important important noting. And I love I love Pat. She's a legend here. But Holly is also coaching in the time of greatest parity that the sport's ever seen. So I think we can forgive a fluky regular season and just look forward to returning talent. And make some outside shots, please. Outside yes, shooting. Please. My goodness. Absolutely, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and focus on uh, two, I guess, one of the most controversial players that Tennessee saw this year, but at the same time, one of the most talented in the other one. Bashar Graves came up big, and Diamond to Shields, big disappointment. That was a little bit more than nine, but I'll forgive you, Jake. Came up big. Anyway, describe no, why. Um, why is that? No, yeah, but I think that was him. He did the, hand, the but, fingers uh, a little bit okay. too fast. It's okay. okay. But um, I, I Bashar know. Graves, 22nd pick with the Minnesota Lynx. Mm -hmm. um, really big as a senior for the Lady Vols. You know, really performed well in some clutch situations. But Diamond to Shields, the transfer from North Carolina... I think that we were expecting more out of her and that sometimes, you know, you read about the talks that she had with her dad before some games and kind of the struggles that she faced mentally off the court, just some stuff that she had to go through. And I think that she really came back in a few games. But overall, I think there are some big question marks with her going into this year. That's fair. And I know we've already talked about this a little bit and we discussed it a few weeks ago, but now that we have... Um, a fuller panel, and you guys have already talked about it a little bit with how they're going to do next season. 
But do you think that they'll make it to the tournament next year? And if so, how far do the Lady Balls go in the tournament? They'll make the tournament on reputation alone because mm-hmm. they could they could go what they could go five hundred. They go five hundred, but be like, yeah, it's Tennessee. You know, they play they play the toughest schedule pretty much all the time. That's true. They put it in, uh, but they, I don't think they'll go five hundred. I think they'll have single digit yeah. losses next year. I think it'll be. I think they'll be one of the top five teams in the country. I think on town alone, there's great parity, but. They're pretty battle tested with the schedule they had to play this year. The gauntlet we saw that once they got to the tournament, they were a more battle tested team. I, I say Final Four. I, I'd agree with that. Uh, that's where I was. That's where I was thinking. Mm-hmm. Mm, I'm gonna go getting back to the Elite Eight, but I wouldn't go Final Four just yet. Hot take. I wrote down at least the Elite Eight. I think we could see Tennessee back in the Final Four, but it all comes down to where they're gonna be placed in terms of bracketology. Yes. Um, because I I hate to be that person, but I think they kind of lucked out this season with mm-hmm. where they were placed. Mm-hmm. Um, the odds were definitely in their favor. Um, as to years previous, we've seen where the, where the odds are stacked against them and they just take control. So it's going to be, it's going to come down to where they're placed whenever uh, Selection Monday rules around next April. Cutting down the um, nets, baby. Right, or next March, I mean. But yeah, you know, they, they could. They, could. they uh, could. We have to see. I mean, Gino's obviously reloaded there, but it's going to be interesting mm-hmm. to see because it's going to be some younger players. Definitely. He's not going to have his world beater out there. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. Right, and we go from talking to about one experienced coach in Gino to another experienced coach, but he's kind of inexperienced in a new place, and we're talking about Rick Barnes. Wow, great segue. Thank you. 10 out of 10. Fantastic. So we're going to go... Different shade dreams. of orange. We're going to go into, yes, different shade of orange. We're going to go into men's hoops here on Rocky Top. So Rick Barnes officially has his first season on Rocky Top under his belt. Vols finished 15 and 19, 6 and 12 in the SEC. There's a lot we could talk about, but what's the one thing that stood out to you from this season? I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I really am struggling to find anything because it's still so early. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to see what he does with the, his his like his players. Mm-hmm. Like he recruits. Who's the next true. Kevin Punter or Josh Richardson? Yeah. Um, who's going to be the gore, the guard, the mm-hmm. gourd? The who's going to be the, the gourd? I'm sorry. Excuse me. I turned into <laughs> dreams for a little bit. <laughs> turned to dreams um, for a little bit. But it uh, really, I actually don't think there will be one this year. I think this is going to be a better team for it. I think that there's going to be a little bit more balance. We're going to have a real point guard out there on the court, um, a couple. We're going to have some playmakers with the ball in their hands. It's going to be some young talent. I think this is an NIT caliber team, and that's a huge step because I think mm-hmm. we're about one or two years away from being a solid NCAA tourney team again. All right. Jake? Mm, I think that <clears> – excuse me, I'm sorry. I've been very hoarse. I've been sick. But um, I think that – You're that, not a horse. You're a human, Jake. Anyway, <laughs> I think the the um, the biggest point that I saw this year was, I mean, Rick Barnes has proved himself fairly well, but at the same time, just looking at a player's perspective, I think that Kevin Punter provided an anchor for this team that they really needed, even when he was hurt. You know, uh, after some big wins, people talked about them facetiming. Punter mm-hmm. after the game, right. and they talked about him sobbing in tears yeah. just because he couldn't be with this team. And I think that that was a big thing, just not only to address R- Barnes as a coach and his recruiting, but the players that they had. Yeah, and for me, looking at this team, I mean, I expected, I don't want to say I had high expectations with Rick Barnes. He's a great coach. I try to not have too many high expectations with most new coaches, but I was really impressed with his rundown as a coach, where he's been, what he's capable of. And so I think that this team this year really, um, they showed their resiliency at home, especially. And that was one thing, that was a storyline that I talked about all season. But I mean, you look at wins that they had at home against Kentucky, South Carolina, and I'm going to throw in Auburn just because that was a very dominant win for Tennessee. So I think what they really need to focus on going into next season, while there's still a lot of months that they have to wait for that, but I think they really need to focus on trying to find that divide where you have your home power, but then taking it on the road. That's where Tennessee was really hurting this season, and I think that could be the changing point, really just um, the deciding factor in how Tennessee does next year, especially in SEC play. Well, if they could have won a few games on the road, it's funny. They were they actually probably could have been a tournament team if they even mm-hmm. went just a shade below 500 on the road. Right, that's true. And Kevin Punter didn't get hurt, obviously. Right. But uh, that this is a team. Rick Barnes can coach. He can. We know that. And he's taken less talented teams to the, to the dance. That's true. 
Um, going over to Tennessee baseball, there's a little less than a month left in the season for them before the SEC tournament begins. Right now, uh, Tennessee baseball stands at 23 and 17, 6 and 12 in the SEC, but they just picked up a major series win, win against Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt, number four Vanderbilt. So, and that was at home, so that's just another um, key point with this win for Tennessee. But while this was a great weekend for the Vols, they still have. Uh, Missouri, Florida, LSU, and Georgia up ahead in SEC play on their schedule. So how will the rest of the season go? Which series do you see them winning? Um, ooh, they, they they better win at Missouri and at Georgia because I think they're better than both teams. Mm -hmm. But it's a road it's a road SEC environment, so it's going to be tough. Right. They really, I mean, they get Florida at home. I mean, they did really good against Vanderbilt at home. So, I mean, to, to dismiss them against Florida at home would kind of be silly. Yeah. Uh, they have games against Eastern Kentucky, Alabama State, Belmont, mm -hmm. ETSU. They should win those games. I could. They they should make it to the SEC tournament. I think they yeah. should make it pretty easily. This is a better team than last year. Um, I'm not gonna say much, but I think that Dave Serrano bought himself another year. With, that, with, with the, the Vandy, Vandy with Vandy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. No, the if he finishes with a winning record, he's got another year. Yeah. Especially That's this, true. he's probably got the most talented players he's had. But in terms of depth, this is probably the least overall talented team he's had. And it's probably been his best coaching job. It's true. He has done a very good coaching job. Um, I think looking at what they have, Florida and LSU are going to be the toughest yeah. um, the toughest series for them. But I, I look for them to at least pick up maybe one win against both. Um, yeah. One win in each series. I'm looking for that. Florida is going to be tough. I think they have a better chance against LSU, but... You know, that it's going to be tough. I definitely think they should win against Missouri and Georgia for sure. I think that those should be easy games or easy series for them. They should be able, if they don't sweep, they definitely can get those two wins easily. Um, but as for them making into the SEC tournament, because that does start it up um, next month, like I said, I think they'll make it. But I think where they're going to be seated is going to range between 10 and 12. 10 yeah. and 12 seed. They're going to be lower down there. I don't really see them being in a mid-seed range at all. You I guys concur. agree with that? Yeah. I concur. I I think they might have a chance as a team Maybe. that can get hot. Um, as long as, as long as the uh, pitching rotation can give some solid performances like they have been able to. Me and David talked about this a while ago. They just need some pitchers, uh, farther back in their rotation to play well, and they have occasionally. And mm -hmm. we'll see if they can if this Vanderbilt series win can propel them forward. That's a good. I think it. I think. It could propel them. We saw a really, we saw a pretty good outing from Zach Warren. He did uh, fairly well, but then um, yesterday Andy Cox came in and was able to really take control of the game, especially with Hunter Morton too. Um, but the win went to uh, Will Neely. Neely, yeah, and that was great for him. That Absolutely. was definitely a win. It was a revenge needed. game. It was the, the, the pitching matchup lost ten to two in the yeah. state championship game, right. in which he was pulled after the eighth inning in a close ball game. Mm-hmm. That ninth inning just was a killer for him. Oh, yeah. So I think game. I think it definitely, this could be a turning point for Tennessee. Maybe we'll see them doing much better. And like you said, they are a team that could get hot, so maybe they could go into the mid-range. But... They have maybe one of the top five players in the SEC in Senzel. Right. I mean, he's a without question going to be a first-round pick. Right. So we'll see what happens with them for the rest of the season. Cause they, like I said, they have less than a month left on their regular season, but for a shorter length of time left in the season. Let's go to Tennessee softball really quick. Their season finishes up in just a couple of weeks. Uh, the team is currently standing at 35 and 12, 12 and 6 in the SEC, and they just picked up their first home loss against Oklahoma. So you go this far into the season and you get your first home loss. That's pretty impressive. But with the time that they have left, just like we did with, um, with baseball, how do you think they've done up to this point, and how do you see them doing with what's left in their season? Well, the Oklahoma game was rough for them. Uh, they committed four errors. Mm -hmm. uh, it could have been five. Big stage, though. It's a young team. It's, it's a no, big stage. No, I, no, I agree with you on that. But, but uh, after the game, they were in the clubhouse for an hour, and the freshmen, I guess allegedly, allegedly. were ye yelling at the upperclassmen because the upperclassmen pretty much gave up during the game because they weren't playing well. And so and then they bound they. Played Lipscomb the next day and they won ten to two. Uh, so I, I don't know where this team is at right now in terms of their chemistry after that Oklahoma game. They, I mean, they could be just fine. I mean, they're saying that, but that doesn't always mean it's the case. Mm -hmm. And they're playing Auburn, which is well. Yeah. Sometimes that tension keeps you on edge. Sometimes that can be a good thing. It keeps I mean, it keeps your adrenaline pumping. It gets you 
and Tansy gets you fired up, which yeah. clearly they needed firing up after that game. I think. Well, this I mean, a, actually, I, I would disagree because the problem in that game was they said was they were too fired up, like they weren't they weren't. Yeah, focused. but we saw at the end of the game. At the yeah. end of the game, if your teammates give up, you need something to light a yeah, spark yeah, yeah, under the behind. Of course. And this is a young team that can beat anybody in the country. I think this team is a year away from perhaps national title contention. This is a team that's definitely going to be in there with the with the big. Oh yeah. With the big teams, they're going to. They have the ability to make a very deep run. They're going to Oklahoma City. Yeah. They have the mm-hmm. ability to win it all. They're young. I think they're about a year away, but it's worth noting this is a team that can beat anybody on any I don't know day. if they have the pitching. Yeah. I can, we can see that. Yeah, I just, I think this team has a lot of promise right now. Like I said, they're 35 and 12, 12 and 6 in the conference. They're showing that they are a strong powerhouse, as they always are. It's Tennessee softball. They're really good. So I think with what's coming on for the rest of the season, especially with like the College World Series, I definitely think they could make it. They are a solid pick to get in there right now. They, they always make it pretty much under the weeklies. Like they always have them in there. Right. So the I RPI think the is really good. Mm-hmm. So I think I think Tennessee fans could be seeing Tennessee softball taking a, a nice trip to Oklahoma City. I think that's definitely in the cards for them right now. But as for what's left with the triple play for this year. That's all. That's all we have to talk about. Goodbye, folks. More that's, adventures. Hashtag that's peace out, TNJ. Yes. Hashtag dreams. That's the wrap-up for dreams, dreams, this dreams, year. Dreams. We will be back in September, probably the first week, so we'll be starting off with uh, Tennessee football talks. So be on the lookout for that, and then we'll get back and talking about the NFL without Peyton Manning. So who knows what we'll be covering. That's going to be a you guys. Remember, fun. today is the first day in the three months without this gorgeous voice. I'm sorry, people. Right, so that's Love Morgan you. there Dreams. with you. But thank you Dreams. for joining us this semester and this year for the Triple Play. This is Danielle Whaley. Uh, join us whenever we come back in September, whenever we bring you more about sports here on Rocky Top. We'll see you then. Dreams.